A little country in the house. Watch it now. <laughs> See if they didn't even know you could sing, much less talk. <laughs> Amen. Be careful what you let out of the box. Amen. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Some of you are actually wearing sweaters and coats like it's a big snowstorm blew in, you know. My granddaughter stayed with me this weekend. She's out there this morning going, ooh. <laughs> so, it's going to be all right. It'll be 90 by Friday, okay? So you'll, you'll be back in Texas and back in Houston. It'll be just marvelous. Praise the Lord. It's good to have family here today. Mom's here. Camille's here. Praise the Lord. Y'all welcome them. In Believers Fellowship, welcome. Amen. Christy, you don't count. You're here all the time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're in a series of messages that we're just starting having to deal with parenting. And it's called No Regrets. Unfortunately, I don't know a lot of parents who've raised kids that, in that capacity. But that's certainly a goal. Uh, but I want to talk about goals and standards and measures that far outweigh and outreach those. But let me start with this passage of Scripture from... Uh, the, the, the scriptures in Psalms where it says in Psalms 127 verses 3 and 4, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. And by the way, it's not a gag gift. <laughs> the fruit of the room is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. You know, you look around today and you see where we're at and where the culture's going. We see so many families that really seem to be failing and few that seem to be succeeding. You really want to spend some reading time just to uh, pull up Google or Yahoo or whatever your favorite search engine might be and type in books on parenting. And you'll get endless pages of books and articles on, pay, uh, on parenting. Everybody has an opinion. Then just watch TV for a little bit. Almost every talk show is going to have some expert in to tell you how to parent your children and how to be the right kind of parent. And it is interesting, you know, when they, when they hand you the baby, how many of you have been to the hospital, you know, when they, when they hand you the baby there and the delivery's taking place and they, you know, they comes out, you know, and uh, they hand you this child, they've kind of wiped off all that yucky stuff and all the things come along with it, you know. And uh, you just sit there and, just, you know, it's, one, it's, really, it's really one of the highlights in life personally, you know, when they, when they hand that child to you, you know. And it's always nice to hear someone say, he looks just like you, of course, he's... <laughs> Head's three times the size of his body, you know, and no hair and teeth. It just looks just like me. But anyway, it's a grand moment in life. But, you know, it's like when the doctor handed me the baby that day. I looked at the doctor, my daughter, my firstborn child's in my arms, and I looked at the doctor and said, okay, now what am I supposed to do with this? Did y'all feel that way? Maybe, maybe I wasn't the only ones, but you think, you know, what an enormous task lies before you as a parent when, they, when, the, when these babies come into your life. You know, I... You have babies, and now I was, I think I was 25, 26, we had our first child. I, I still felt like a baby, you know? And some of you have had them much younger, you know? Some of you here expecting babies that are, hadn't reached 25, 26 perhaps yet. And you, you know, it, it's, it's a world of challenge. But you're not left up to yourself, and God hadn't left us up to ourselves. And you don't have to go to Google. You can just go to God, all right? <laughs> And do the search engine with him and see what comes up. And because the Bible is just filled with biblical applications and illustration and principle and commands even. One after the other to tell us about parenting and what the expectations ought to be. And what the, how we as parents ought to handle this particular situation called children in our life. But if you look at the world and you look at all the popular books and talk shows, you discover several things. In fact, I got these little three points here from a book by, I'll mention a little bit later on, by... Uh, by George Barna. You know, Barna's known specifically for all the uh, surveys and in the Christian realm, evangelical realms that he does. But he did a, a book called Revolutionary Parenting, which he, he went through. And he says, as we and our research staff went across all the materials that seem to be available out there today for parents, we discovered there's about three types of parents that are out there in the world. Now, we're going to talk about types of parents, but then we're going to talk about out of those types, we're going to talk about styles of parents. But he broke it down like this. He said, first of all, there's the, the experimental parent, all right? That's where the influence uh, that, that shapes your parenting choices or your parenting behavior is uh, derived from personal experiences and uh, uh, not per personal, but from the cultural experiences and cultural forces and things that are happening around you. Like, what's the latest book say? What's the latest talk show? What's the latest rave and parenting styles? And that's parenting by default. It's just kind of driven by cultural forces. The second kind of parenting he talked about in his book was experimental parenting. 
the influences uh, that shape your parenting choices and, and the behavior that you have as, as a parent is derived from personal experiences and outcomes, doing what comes naturally, or learn basically what we've learned from our own past endeavors from being raised as children, how our parents taught us, and it's just kind of parenting that's gleaned and worked out in the trenches of life, going through the battles of life, trying to figure out what to do. That's just a trial and error process. Unfortunately, that's probably one of the more popular styles of parenting today. And then there's what we'll call the biblical parenting. That's that third approach that's, uh, uh, that's available to parents. And by the way, this particular approach is based upon application of biblical truths and biblical principles and biblical narratives. What does the Bible have to say? And it literally flies in the face of cultural parenting. It's against everything that the culture is telling us. It's, it seems to be completely the opposite. It, it creates emotional tension with the world. When you tell them that you're using a biblical style of parenting with your children, people get a little, uh, well, in the market of ideas and practice, it's not the most commonly accepted. In fact, it's the most commonly rejected way. But God's Word, it's the way to go. It's, got, it's the manual. It's, it's the means by which you can be the kind of parent that God wants you to be and have the kind of children as a result of that using His perspective perhaps what you might want to call his marching orders so that your children do become like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. Arrows that have direction. Arrows that have purpose. Arrows that have a reason for existing. Arrows that have a driving force to accomplish whatever tasks are set forth. Arrows are needed in the hands of the, of the warrior if he's going to succeed in war. Now the goal, if you're going to go with a biblical parenting route, the goal of child rearing that way is to raise children, you know, to bring up kids who make their faith in the Lord and their relationship with Him the highest priority of their life. We want kids that love God, basically, and they want to proceed in life once they leave the nest, so to say, to live in a very intentional and devoted way to be the servants that God wants them to be. That's the goal of a parent. Every godly parent, I think, wants that for their children. Hey, my kids are committed to Christ. My kids are, are serious about their relationship with God. My kids, basically, I want them to be spiritual. The role of the parent in this regard is to guide the child to really understand biblical principles and the outcomes that honor God and advance the kingdom of God, the purposes of God. Success in this venture is measured completely differently from the way success is measured in the world. Success in this regard is measured by transformed lives, transformed livings. So I label this particular kind of parenting style biblical parenting, spiritual parenting, measuring by a different standard. Now, we can go along with the, what most many Christians believe, and even the world obviously believes, is a, is a measure or a standard of success. How, how do you measure that? Well, parents say, I feel like I'm doing a good job as a parent if I provide for the basic needs of food, clothing, shelter. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're physically taken care of, they're, they're physically healthy, they're, they're doing well, or I've succeeded. Or they're performing at or beyond their grade level. Some parents think they're really successful if the kids are performing beyond their grade level. In other words, you know, if they're not seeming to be a bit moronic around their friends, it's helpful, okay? Now, I, I am succeeding in some regard. Or, you know, I, I consider success to be that they're in, a, they're in an environment and in a home. It's, I provided a comfortable living for them, and it's safe and it's secure, and they're, they're monitored and cared for by loving parents who genuinely care for them. And, you know, they, they've gotten involved in church. I take them to church. They love church. They, they're committed to church. So they're, therefore, I must be successful. And, and it goes on. There's some other things. They're, they're connected to decent friends. They, they're not involved with gangs. That's a praise the Lord. They're, they're not taking drugs. They're not alcoholics. They're not out of control sexually. They're not involved in cults and satanic activity. They're not the victim of physical abuse or mental abuse. They're, they're well taken care of and, 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 and watched over. And praise the Lord that they're by 15. We've reached them without a criminal record or related problems. It's wonderful. We're succeeding. Now, I'm not going to downplay those measures, all right? Those are nice to accomplish. But those measures, although they are meaningful, they are not the measures by which we go by if we're going to be biblical parents. In fact, they can be absolutely the wrong measures. Now, if you measure wrong, you can ask any carpenter, contractor, engineer in this room today, if you measure wrong, then your outcome is wrong. So we have to know as biblical parents, what's the right measure? 
What's the right standard that I can gauge success by, perhaps, and, 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 and assess on that I'll know that will produce the right results? Well, I think the measure we should use is the measure that God uses with our children. And I think God uses a very simple measure. He, he measures our hearts. The Bible says that God looks upon the heart. God sees where you are. God sees where your children are. God created us to have a relationship with Him, to walk with Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to obey Him, to grow in Him. So He studies the indicators that are most important in our life. And those indicator, the most important indicator, is where we are with God in our heart and in our life. So as parents then, our job, if you're really going to have a measure, is to, uh, is to ignore, is not to ignore those significant developing things that are in their life, but the mental, emotional, educational, other attributes in their life. But it really gets down to then, we're, we're being called to raise spiritual children. Children who love God. Children who want to honor Christ with their life. Children who are like arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior. They have purpose. There's direction. There's meaning to their life. They're not just kind of floating through the world. Now, I mentioned the book by George Barna a while ago called Revolution, Revolutionary Parenting. It's a good read, and I would encourage you, especially if you're raising kids right now, pick this up at your local bookstore or download it or whatever you need to do to get a hold of it. 98% of this book is excellent. Now, there's one little part in there I'm just not real keen on. If you buy the book, call, come to me, and I'll tell you what it is, all right? But it's, it's a good read, and it's a good buy, and I think we ought to always be arming ourselves and preparing ourselves. But one thing he talked about, if we're going to use a standard that's the right standard, and if we're going to have a measure by which we go by that will produce the, the right kind of results, then we, we need to look and hold it up high and hold it next to our children and see if we're succeeding or are we failing. Now, if you take the average Christian kid in churches today across the nation, according to Barnes survey, you'll see that we are failing by God's standards. When you take the children, and they surveyed many of these evangelical families and churches from across the nation, and these are some of the statistics that Mr. Barna came up with. His bottom line conclusion is this. First of all, our children are mostly biblically illiterate. They just don't know the Bible. Even though they may go to great churches, some to dead churches, doesn't matter. This is just where they are. When you consider the findings from this survey I'm going to show you, it'll probably shock you as well to say, hey, you know, this is this something's wrong. Now, this was a national sampling that they did, representative of, of, of children between the ages of 8 years old and 12 years of age. So you kind of know we're talking about children or adolescents in this survey. That's the category in the realm that he's referring to in the survey they did. Basically saying they're biblically illiterate. Here's the reason why. Their ignorance of the Bible teaching corresponds to the fact that only 36% of adolescents fully believe that the Bible is accurate in all the principles that it teaches. Now, one thing that parents have to understand before they can teach this to their children is they must believe that the Bible is inerrant and the Bible is infallible and the Bible is the Word of God. It is truth without any need of your help or interpretation. It is the Word of God, complete and full in itself, giving life, living and powerful. But when parents don't believe that, obviously children don't believe that, or even worse, when parents do believe it and don't incorporate it into the hearts and the minds of their children, then certainly you have problems. It went on to say, few of our children are motivated to share their faith in Christ with others. One of the first things every child of God ought to be learning from their parents is, and seeing modeled in their parents is, we have a responsibility to the kingdom. To our Heavenly Father. Jesus paid too great a price for us to set by and not share radically, as the Bible calls us to, our faith with other people in Jesus Christ. But children aren't doing this. Less than one out of, out of every five, 19% contend that they, that, that they have a responsibility to, to evangelize their peers. They don't think it's their deal. You know, most kids say 80%. Well, we don't have a responsibility to do that. But listen to me, every young person in this room, you have a responsibility before God to share your faith. The Bible says, go and make disciples of all nations. That's written to all Christians. You're a Christian? Then it's written to you. Very clearly, but yet there's this illiterate problem. He goes on to say in the survey that less than half of our young people, 46%, less than half state that their religious faith is very important in their lives. It's just not a big deal in this particular group. How important is your faith in Jesus? How important is your love for God? <laughs> Only one-fourth of them, 28%, even believe that the devil is real. And I don't know about you, but to me this is staggering. 
And he goes on to say, that obviously from the statistic, that salvation baffles most of our kids because only 8 out of 10 believe the idea that good people can earn their way into heaven. Majority of young people in this sampling, if you're good, you can get to heaven. That you can, when the Bible makes it clear, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. But here are these children. Are we failing in this regard? Seven out of ten believe that everyone experiences the same post-death outcome regardless of what they believe. And it goes on a little bit further when he said, eight out of every ten children agree with the statement. What statement? The people cannot know for sure what will happen to them after they die. Which is not really possible to know. It's not important. He goes on with just a few more, all right, because I want you to see just how critical this hour is because, you know, sometimes, oh, that's not, that's not good. But listen carefully. 56% of our kids, 56% of our kids are willing to entertain the idea that Jesus Christ sinned while he lived on the earth. When the Bible makes it very clear that he who knew no sin became sin. He was spotless. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sins, yet 56% of the kids say, well, not necessarily. So the majority of our kids, in this survey revealed, live for things other than the most important thing, which is loving God with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. That's the most important thing. But most don't believe that's the most important thing. Specifically, only 4 out of 10 live with that purpose in mind, is what the, the, those, the survey went to set on. Only 40% really live with that purpose in mind. These are church kids. However, not only is the lower than expected based upon adult surveys, but we found through the survey that fewer young people today, only 58% believe that God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe who still rules all of creation. Now, if our goal is to be spiritual, biblical parents and to raise spiritual kids, if they're that ignorant concerning the Word of God, and that is the measure of the standard, is the Word of God, then certainly we are failing. Now, you, you can add to the fact that just a couple more things. One, one third of American children ardently contend that Jesus Christ returned to physical life after his crucifixion and death on the cross. The two thirds don't even believe in the physical bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. By their own admission, our children are confused theologically based on the reaction to statements like, it doesn't matter what religious faith I follow because they all teach similar lessons. It's clear they do not know what to think about competing belief system or competing worldviews. Biblically illiterate. You add to that fact that our national survey of 13-year-olds revealed that most of them think they already know everything of significance in the Bible. They don't need to learn anymore is what they say. That's the majority of them, all right? They've, they've studied enough. We have no intention on continuing the Word of God, especially when we leave home. We're not going to continue. This all adds up to a crisis. Now, I know what you're thinking. Most 13-year-olds think they don't need any further education on any level. <laughs> and when they hit 16, they've already achieved. They know everything. When they hit about 22, then the bottom falls out. Now, what's our response to this? Well, our response is you go through that and just take a, just, and this is kind of all introductory today as we get into so many different things. But our response to this is that we are in a crisis. And if we are in a crisis, especially if you have, you're a parent, uh, getting ready to be a parent, if you're a grandparent, you need to be ready to understand what the Bible has to say and discover what really then is the best way to parent our children. All right? And what does the Bible have to say about parenting our children? There's a couple of aspects in this message. You know, there's three aspects. We won't even get to the third today about this message. First, I want to talk about the mandate of our dedication as parents. In other words, what's the commitment and how much commitment does it take if you're going to be a parent? And then there's the, the manner of your demeanor. What's your style? We talked about different types, you know, the, the parents that kind of flow in our culture from just experimental parenting to you know, whatever the status quo is, to personal experience, to the biblical. But what, what are you choosing as a style of parenting for your life? And if I choose to go with that style, what are the results going to be in my life if that's the, the, the path I take? And then next week and the week after, we'll get into some of these issues concerning uh, our methods of discipline. And that's always a controversial issue, no matter where you go in our culture today. Even on the newscast I was hearing this week, you know, about uh, the issues of, of uh, chastening in schools and spanking in schools and all those things. But what, what is the, what's the right course to take in these things? What, in, right, not in my opinion, or your, but what does the Bible have to say in this regard? So that's where we'll kind of leave it, and we'll be heading towards that direction as we get into the end of the message today. But the mandate of dedication, that's the, the, the issue that deals with our commitment. Our commitment. 
Now, I saw this morning as I was leaving my home and going to the Magnolia campus, about 7.15, 7.20, as I drove by the baseball park, it was filled with children and coaches and parents already at this time of the morning, on Sunday morning, and you see right there, it's just where's the level of commitment to being a spiritual parent and biblical parenting. When we teach our children that sports and activities are more important than church and God and the Bible, then certainly we've already set a wrong precedent right away. You have to teach your children priorities by the actions you take, not just by the words that you say. And we'll talk about that. But what you're going to discover is this, this, this issue on the mandate of parenting is important. Just what is the level of my commitment? Now, before you answer that, I think you need to understand that children are an expression of the glory and the unity of marriage. That God is the one who creates every life a little form. But in, when I have a child, my wife and I have a child, we did something together that could not be done alone. We created this new life and, and, and for the glory of God. And it, it was a result and should be a result of the deepest intimacy of heart and mutual affection. We shared in something, you know, in, in the creation of life, something we couldn't do by ourselves. It took the grace of God and, and our unity together. We did something together. And you need to realize that those children are an expression, not only the glory of God, they're an expression of your love and your unity that you are supposed to have one to another. But understand as well, those children will be a duplication of you and your life and your mannerisms and your philosophy on so many different levels. There'll be a duplication of your conduct on so many different levels. There'll be a duplication of your character on so many different levels. When that child is in your care from the day it draws its first breath and dirties its first diaper, you know, that child is going to take and store in its little mind all that he sees and all that he hears, all the world around him, all the scenes from his home, all the scenes of, of respect, all the scenes of conflict, all the love, all the fears, all the hate, all the rejection, all the acceptance. He's going to sense all that, know all that, and store it in his little heart and mind. That's why it's important you realize this mandate that you have before you of parenting and the commitment that needs to be made to it. To love your child. In fact, it's not even biblically, I think, scripturally, in clear love your child, it demanded in scripture. Because it is the norm. It's the expected. It, it's needless to even tell us that. I mean, if you had any kind of conscience whatsoever, when that child is handed to you those first days of life and breath that that child breathes, there's something about you that reaches out and instantly just loves that little child. So it's really needless to have this biblical command. But it does tell us that there are some things that we need to do as parents as part of this mandate. In fact, we talked about this a few weeks ago when I talked about the things that are destroying homes. We talked about the needs of children. And these are basic needs, and they can be stated different ways, but it really gets down, and our children need to be loved. Affection. They need to be received, not rejected. They need attention. It takes care and loving attention. And they need achievement. They need to, to know that they're moving forward and growing and progressing. These are just natural, normal things that happen in the heart of a child. If I'm going to be the parent that is to provide those four elements to their life, then it's going to take tremendous dedication. It requires dedication. It is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week responsibility. Not just for mom, or not just for dad, but for mom and dad. And if you do love that child, you really express love for that child, it will provide all these things and discipline as well will be provided. It takes commitment. It takes dedication. You can't just dump the child off with someone or just say the wife will do it or the husband will do it. It requires a commitment of unity, a commitment from both parents to be what God's called you to be so that you can be for them the parent you need to be to them. Let's talk about what your style is, as we said a moment ago. Ephesians 6, 4 tells us, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Children, children, if there's anybody that can want, provokes you to anger, it can be children. <laughs> but it says here, Fathers, don't provoke your, your children to anger. Isn't that an interesting twist? And I want to deal much more with, uh, deeper on that on another level as we get to the next two Sundays specifically and talk about this. But the idea here, he does, there's two important things that he, he says how we are to bring them up here. He says, I want you to bring them up. And the first thing he mentions here is bringing them up. The two areas that are given, the first one is discipline or the nurture. And these words are simultaneous here. To nurture. Nurturing is something that's done by training in action. 
Training in action. The second word he mentions here is instruction or admonition. Admonition means to a putting in mind. Something that's done by training in word. So you see two sides of the coin here. There's training by actions and there's training by words. You, you can't just do one and not the other. You have to do both. You can't just say, don't do as I do, do as I say. That doesn't work. You have to do what you do as well as you say what you do. It requires both. And if you shirk the, the, the responsibility of nurturing and admonishing, of living it as well as speaking it, then you're going to pay a high price for many generations to come. It takes more than money. It takes more than time. It takes more than talent to be that kind of parent. You say, what's it take? It takes you. It takes you. Nobody else can do that for you. It takes you. There was an interesting study as I was looking through these different parenting, what is your style. There was a Dr. Dennis Gurney who described four types of parents, and his study was based on a study by three PhDs at the University of Minnesota. And he said from this study, there's three basic kinds of parents. And out of these, by the way, one of them falls into a biblical parenting role if they apply it in a biblical sense, all right? But he said of two of these types that we'll talk about, they produce children that resent authority, don't like themselves or anybody else. All right. The other type produces children that are more positive, acting and tend to like themselves as well as are respectful to others. So let's just look at these. And you, you go down the list and perhaps you'll see maybe the way you were raised as a child or maybe the type of parent that you are as a parent in regard to your child or to your children. The first one he mentioned in the study was the dominant parent. Now, a dominant parent has high standards, high expectations, you know, but there's no real nurturing. There's no real warm, caring support. There's lots of regulations, but no explanation. Just do what I say, don't ask questions, all right? And studies have shown, you know, that, that uh, people that with, with, with children like this usually have a, aggressive kind of children being raised from this particular st lifestyle. The typical statements for, for parents like that, you know, are, are, are the kind of things, well, your rules are rules. You're going to go to bed without your dinner. I won't stand your back talk. You apologize, or I'm going to slap your face. You say that again, I'm going to knock you in the next Thursday. I'm going to hit you so hard, they're going to arrest you in El Paso for speeding. <laughs> you don't need a reason. You just do what I told you to do. No child of mine is going to be a lazy goof up. Now get in there now. Let me say, that sounds like me. <laughs> These kids, and for a real reason, will rank the lowest in ability to conform to rules or other people. They tend to reject as they get a little older, obviously, all their values of their parents. They'll gravitate to kids just like them, and they usually grow up to be loud, demanding people, always wanting their rights, disruptive, always to get somebody to pay attention to them and focus on them. That's the dominant parent. We need dominance, but we need to have it in the right way. Now, there's neglectful parents. A neglectful parent, according to this study, lacks any real loving support and control, which seems to be obviously for the, the dominant parent as well. And there's an immature attitude, you know, uh, by la it's always expressed by lashing out at the children, you know, and when they're always irritated. They're as childish as the child is in many cases in this regard. You've got parents who haven't matured themselves, and they're still just interested in what they want and what they can get out of it. In fact, sometimes the children can, can be viewed as, as, as kind of a bother. These parents are absent from home a lot. Uh, if they are home, they're emotionally absent from home, mentally absent from home when they are there. This is the parent who's always got to find a babysitter. You know, always got using lots of, lots of sitters. And if you followed through with these particular studies I was looking at survey, in surveys, there was a Dr. Armand Nikolai who was a professor of Harvard Medical School. And he said four, the reason kids are neglected today, and these were the four reasons. One was the high rate of divorce. And by the way, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be extremely and tremendously difficult for a single parent to raise children. It can be done. It's not impossible because God promises to be there and promises to be a parent in, in cooperation with you in Scripture. But it's got to be difficult. It's harder. But there, there's so many kids today. In fact, there's, they say 13 to 14 million children living with a single parent today. I didn't say 13 or 14, and I didn't say 130 or 140. I didn't even say 1,300 or 1,400. I didn't say 130,000. I said 13 million. I mean, I think we've heard so much about numbers these days, and the politicians talk about trillions. We forgot what millions was. 
Millions. That's astounding. They said the second reason was the increase in mothers in the workforce. With more than 50% of our uh, American women working, they say that American parents spend less time with their children than parents all over the world. In fact, the average American father spends, they say, quality time with their child 37 seconds a day. There was a study that quoted Russian dads never spend less than two hours a day with their children. I don't know about you, but that's a completely phenomenal statistic to me. You hear a lot about said, you know, well, you know, it's the, it's the quality of time, not the quantity of time. Well, the Bible says it's the quantity of time. If you want quality time, it takes time. If it's really quality, then it takes quantity. It takes time with kids. You just can't just wind them up and set them loose and put them in front of a TV, which is another reason we have the, the kids like this and the neglectful parents. These kids are exposed to excessive TV. It's just the way they're, they're raised, the way they're parented, the way they're, you know, if you want to deal with kids, just put them in front of a TV, stick a DVD, you know, and there's no interaction. There's no emotional interaction. There's, there's no meaningful interaction. Children, you know, like this, they, they start beginning to grow. There's something in them that knows their parents ought to love them. So there's something that begins to build in them saying, well, my parents don't really spend any time with me. Well, let's see, maybe they don't care. They feel that maybe if they were a better kid, their parents would love them more. Maybe they'd want to be with them more. The typical statements, we talk about typical statements from these different parents, you know, from this kind of parent is, well, don't bother me. Or work it out by yourself. Can't you see I'm busy? Or no, I'm expected somewhere else. Get your brother to help you. Get your mother to help you. Get your dad to help you. Go ask them. Or that's your problem. Go work it out. It's not my problem. Stay out of my hair. I'm busy. Go away. I've got things to do. Hey, I'd like to let you, but I, I don't have time to help you. So we just missed the mark. You become that parent who's, who's missing, you know, in action. Even though you may, as I say, be present, you're missing in action. And what happens to a kid like this who has a parent who constantly puts them off or who neglects them or always turning them over to babysitters or always turning them over to TV? Well, the possible effects on your children are, is that the neglect in their life by you as a parent produces something that the Bible calls a wounded spirit. And the scripture says in Proverbs, who can bear a wounded spirit? Who can bear it? Who can deal with it? Their spirit has been wounded. It, it teaches the child by actions that they're really just not worth your time. And obviously, you have a child who's insecure. You have a child who has no confidence in their life. You have a child who seems to have no ground, grounds or foundation to stand on. They get promises. They get commitments, but they're not kept and they're not upheld. And broken promises in the heart of a child will always break the spirit of a child. So you, I was always careful as a parent, tried to be careful, saying, hey, I promise, or we're going to do this, or even saying, I will. Because in the child's ear, when a parent says, yes, or I will, or even says, maybe, it's a promise. <laughs> so you have to be very clear. We have a lot of kids like this in our school system, and they just do so poorly because there's no motivation at home. Teachers will tell you that. There's just no motivation from parents and no support from parents. We just think it's the government's job to raise our kids, teach our kids, educate our kids, inform our kids. And you've missed it. Which leads us to the third kind of parent, the permissive parent. They're warm, they're supportive, but you know, when it comes to, to establishing rules, they are very weak. All right? Which the fourth kind you saw was the immobile society that we're living in. But the, the, the permissive parent is the one who, you know, feels that, you know, they, they don't want to do anything and they really don't want to enforce too many rules uh, because, you know, you just, you just don't want to damage the child. And if you're too strict, you just, you just might hurt them in, in some regard. So they fear confrontation with the child. They, they try to go away from confronting the things that, that might produce maybe fearful hearts in the child. And they completely miss the whole context of nurture and admonition. Now, the permissive parent usually will be supportive. They're a warm, perhaps maybe they're affectionate parent. They're their kind of parent, but they, they just don't have any... any boundaries produced for the children. There seems to be no structure for the kids, and certain degree of, of permissiveness for parents is understandable. I mean, I, we can be permissive in certain areas, but it can't, be a, it can't be a lifestyle. You have to have some standards. You don't freak out whenever there's a problem, and by the way, you know, uh, permissive parents like to, to use excuses like, kids will be kids, so just leave them alone. You know, you, you've seen them in the restaurant when the parents won't ever correct them in the restaurant. You know, and the kid's just out of control, and they just kind of smile. Oh, kids will be kids. You know, they're, they're just, that's just the way they are. Well, yeah, that's true to a degree, but that's why God gave them parents Amen. to teach them. 
and to instruct them what their behavior is like. Kids will be kids. Kids do stupid things. Kids, kids fall out of trees, all right? They climb trees. They spill milk. You know, you don't freak out, but you do teach them. You know, kids don't know everything. And so you can't be afraid of teaching them. You can't be this kind of permissive parent. And on the other hand, we know that being over-permissive, you know, uh, certainly allows for undesirable traits. If, you, if you're a parent who uses that, te- well, I just don't want to teach them anything. Tell them it. That's, you just raised a kid who likes to beat other kids up at school. <laughs> They just get away with anything. They're the kids always writing on the buildings and marking buildings and breaking stuff and don't care, have no respect for people and no respect for others. Typical statements from the over-permissive parent is like this. Well, it's all right, you know. You can stay up as long as you like. Or, oh, you're so tired, aren't you? I know you have a responsibility. You're supposed to be somewhere tomorrow. Or you're supposed to have a paper out. You're so tired. You don't have to do that. Or I'll do it for you. I know, you, you, some of you are getting sick already. <laughs> Another statement, oh, I just hate to see Johnny under all that pressure. Johnny, I know there's a test tomorrow, and you've been, st- don't study anymore. You're so tired, it's so hard. You just, you just don't have to go to school tomorrow. We don't want them to fail, by the way, do we? And this one makes me excited when I see it in public. Oh, don't be angry with me. <laughs> don't be angry with me. You know, don't make a scene. Jimmy, please. Try to hurry. We don't want to be late, do we? <laughs> Listen, a child knows who's in the driver's seat. That's right. That's right. A child knows. I kept my granddaughter this weekend. She's four years old. She knows if she's in the driver's seat. And she doesn't like it when she's not. Most kids don't. And they test and try the boundaries immediately. But if you let them do that, you will raise up a child who is so insecure in their lives, they'll always be leaning against the wrong walls that look like they're firm, but they always fall over. They have no discipline in their life and no self-discipline in their life. Because there's no standards. There's no guidelines. Which brings us to the fourth kind of parent, which is that we wrap our heart and mind around, can be the biblical parent, because there's a lot of loving and firm parents, but we need to take it more than just loving and firm. We need to say, I want to be that biblical parent, that loving and firm biblical parent. And what is that parent like? Well, that parent is willing to stand on the Word of God, and they've established good biblical limits, and, and the, the child knows what they are and is aware of what they are. They clearly understand. They have taken the time to un- help them understand. That's called training. All right, that's the, the admonition, that's the nurturing. And it's a healthy combination between a dominant parent and a permissive parent. You have kind of wed the two and you know when to stand and when to give a little space and when to have little opportunities for them to take a little space. But you, 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 know, you can't be uh, uh, one or the other. There's, there is a happy boundary. You, you can't say, okay, you, know, you, you can intentionally break all the furniture in the house because I don't want to harm your spirit. There has to be some lines. Firmness. But it's firmness and strength combined with genuine passion and love, but not only loving actions and loving words, it's loving deeds, all right? The actions and the words go together. And the parent that follows this particular line is that parent who understands the combination of firmness and as well as having a heart that loves. And the typical statements like that are a little different. Something like, Johnny, you're late for dinner again. There's going to be a price to pay. And, you know, I think the, we'll talk about this next week. The punishment must meet the crime, all right? Not everything is a spanking offense. But what you do with your actions of this child is you, this kid knows he's showing up for dinner in spite, in spite of the fact that he knows he's not supposed to show up for dinner late, he does anyway. And it's a willful rejection. So there is a way to work that out and work through that. Out of this parent comes a different attitude. It says, you know, I'm not going to let you stay up all night because here's what staying up all night produces. It's not what the result you want. It's not the result I want. This kind of parent knows when to be firm and has the patience to know how to be firm. This kind of parent doesn't blow up and act like a child when the child acts like a child. This kind of parent knows that when it's time to tell the child to sit down straight and face to them and say, hey, we're both going to cool off here and then we're going to have a talk and we're going to settle this problem. The child gets difficult time and a problem seems to be stuck on it. They say, I'll help you this time so you'll know what to do next time. You say all the other kids are doing it? Well, let's take a closer look at what that means. All right? And, and, and you take the time. 
You expect responsibilities. You, you expect actions. You expect obedience. You can't answer the phone if you don't know how to answer the phone. How many of y'all like to let your kids answer the phone? <laughs> Isn't that just irritating on the other end? <laughs> you get to answer the phone when you know how to answer the phone and you know how to do it the right way. In other words, there's clearly defined limits to build confidence and the clearly defined limits that help with them understanding what having respect, not only for themselves, but for individuals and for people and for properties. And that's a very important part of character when they learn how to respect other people and other people's properties. A child is more content when he learns to have discipline and when he learns to have self-control. His spirit is, will not be closed. You can communicate with a child like this. And a child like this will communicate with you. He doesn't just close the doors every time something goes on in his life. His world becomes more secure because he realizes limitations. He understands what happens if you break the rules. He knows what rules are for. He understands there's a red light at the intersection to stop people from running over each other. And there are red lights at intersections of our life so that we learn how to have safe boundaries around us. That's the biblical parent. There is a domination part. There is a leadership part. There is a parenting part. There's also the part that says, I love you. I'll be patient with you. I'll work with you so you know how to do what you're supposed to be doing. The parent follows both lines of biblical instruction, works on this both sides. It's the nurture, the discipline, the actions, and the admonition. The most two important part, important part of raising kids, and they're not based upon my opinion, they have to be based upon the Word of God. Nurturing, admonishing, disciplining, based on biblical principles. It's vital if we're going to raise godly children, if we're going to have a right standard, which is the Word of God. Listen, Proverbs 13, 24 says this, He that will spare his rod hates his son, but he that loveth him chastens him often, or be times, as King James Version says. What's that saying? If you're going to be a loving parent, it will require times of chastening. But understand, discipline isn't always a negative. Discipline is always a positive, even though it may feel negative, even though it may appear negative. The Lord disciplines His children because He's a perfect Father. And He disciplines us consistently. And He disciplines us righteously. And those are some of the things we'll talk about in next week's sermon. Because one thing that hinders proper discipline with most parents is the lack of consistency. What we will chastise a child for one day, we let them the next day get away with. So there has to be a consistency in your parenting. But what are we called to, even as an individual, just a man, disregard the fact of being father and husband, just as a man. I have submitted my life to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm to be a disciple, it takes Discipline. Discipline. The root word is disciple. It means there's commitments. It's sacrifices, actions, deeds, words. All follow as I make choices. Now, I want to disciple my children. I have a loving father who disciples me, and within the context that sometimes that discipling is not pleasant. And sometimes it's just glorious but it's all within the same umbrella. It's all within the same umbrella of discipline. It just seems difficult with certain types of discipline. Proverbs 22 tells us that with children, though, foolishness is bound up in their heart. And the rod of correction, of discipline, instruction, will drive it from him. And I'm not, it's not just, you know, some people like to take this, well, you I mean, whoop them every day, you know? Are you not whooping them enough? Listen, I find out the more that you learn biblical parenting, the less you have to whip your children. If you're still whipping your kids at their teenagers, you certainly missed the mark. It ought to end well in the early, early years because they've learned some simple principles. Parenting. How much time does it take? All the time. It's an all-the-time job. The Bible says, while you're in the way, Raise up a child in the way that he should go. And that means having to find out, you know, just the way is the word of God's way, the way that God has for them, God's will for their life. And obviously it means that I'm walking with him in the way. So we'll talk about some of those things in regard to discipline more next week. But there has to be a heart of a parent who's committed. 
to discipline the children and doing it righteously. But not, don't just think of discipline in the context of a rod or spanking spoon or whatever it might be in your house. Think of it in the context of a life of giving direction, love, loving, loving direction, loving, loving pursuit of their life for the glory of God. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, we love you today. And we realize that if we're not allowing you to parent us,